Maybe see. When your car is broken too, there's only one thing you want to do. Open your mouth and let it spew. But I am telling you, stay positive. When you're baking a cake for your family, your kids are hopped up on caffeine. Your fluffy cake is now kind of lean. Remember, don't be mean, stay positive. Well, good morning. How's everybody this morning? Good. I'm glad you're here. I'm sorry I had to, I was trying to print something from my computer. Uh, no, it's good, good to have you this morning. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, you know, it's so good. We're in the middle of a, we're actually just kicking off a sermon series this morning on staying positive, and uh, you're going to get sick of that little tune here before the end of uh, this series is over, but uh, hopefully not. But we are so glad that you're here. I'm so glad that you actually made it uh, to church this morning. When I get my notes here fixed, it will be good. But uh, there's a lot of great things that are happening in our church, a um, lot of super exciting stuff. And uh, so be sure and check your bulletins this morning and, and read through all that stuff. We're going to take a lot of time to announce all that stuff. But isn't it good to be in God's house? And isn't it great to be here this morning? I, I love actually being in church every every week. But I'm excited about this message here. I think that there is Overall, I think in our culture, there is an epidemic of negativity. There's just this epidemic of, you know, you know my life is messed up. I don't, I don't you know, things aren't working. There's like self-talk. I, I don't fit in. I don't make it. I, uh, I don't have what it takes. My life stinks. Things are going from bad to worse. Uh, the economy's doomed. You know, our families are falling apart. The school system stinks. Our church is dying. And uh, teenagers don't even be talking about teenagers. There, but I think just in general, there's this overwhelming sense in this, you know, especially in this election year, there's this overwhelming sense of dread and doom and negativity. And so I'm really excited about to look at some things and what God's word teaches us about being positive. And there is a lot of bad in the world. There's no doubt. There's no doubt in my mind that there are bad things that are happening right this second, to, you know, while we are sitting here in church and there are bad things in this world, no doubt. But there are also, I believe, a ton of really good things that happen. And it's really just a buzzard or hummingbird mentality. And I don't know if you've ever, you've ever thought about buzzards or hummingbirds, uh, but really, buzzards look for dead stuff. Hummingbirds look for sweet stuff. And whatever you look for, you will find. In fact, in Proverbs 11, chapter 27, it says this, if you search for good, you will find favor. But if you search for evil, you, it will find you. And so my question this morning is, are you looking for the negative in your world or are you looking for the positive? In essence, are you a buzzard or are you a hummingbird? So if somebody calls you a buzzard today after church, think about that. No, we shouldn't be calling names to church. But just think about that. And, you know, I think about that. And, you know, I know Cheryl, every, every spring puts out the little hummingbird feeder, the little plastic dollar store hummingbird feeder that she hangs in, you know, by her flowers. And I'm always amazed that every, I mean, it doesn't take hardly any time. And we have hummingbirds on that thing. And they suck that thing dry. And so it just, it's interesting to me that whatever you look for is what you're going to find. And I think sometimes that our, our approach and our thought of positive attitude and being positive, positive uh, is great, and whatever we look for is going to find what we find, but really I'm going to come at you from a different angle this week, and we're really, my title of my message this morning is Optimism, and uh, you know, you, you talk about optimists and pessimists, and the glass, half full, the glass is half full or glass half empty, and you know, you even take that from a, a biblical perspective, and I don't know if you know those people, if you've ever been around people like that, but the optimist will take a scripture like, my cup runneth over, and an optimist will say, that is awesome, thank you God for the blessings that you've bestowed on my life, and a pessimist will take that same scripture and say, my cup runneth over, and then they're ticked off because there's going to be something on the carpet, you know? It's like, oh, well, thanks a lot, God. Now there's a mess on the carpet. My cup fell up. So it's just however you look at life and how we approach things in our life. But, um, you know, and it's funny. I think some of you, even when I announce this, I, for the most part, people are like, I'm looking forward to this. But there's still some people that are just like, you know, I'm not, I'm not even really happy about this. I don't want to be happy. Uh, <laughs> I guess, but have you ever noticed, uh, I don't know if you've ever been like me, um, every now and then you'll have a day that just goes south, and then like every, 
every, literally everything that you try to do that day goes in the wrong direction, or you have a, is anybody, am I alone? But I, I, I've had days like that, and I'll, you know, I may be in a hurry, or I'll wake up late, and I'll be in a hurry, and I'll go the back way uh, through, uh, from our house over here to Tontai, and try to cross the tracks at Tontai, and the railroad, um, whew, the, the, the train is always constantly just stopped on the tracks out there, and then I'll pick up my phone to try to call somebody to tell them that I'm going to be late, and I'll drop my phone, and then I don't know if you, you guys have this in your car, but I've got this space between my seat and the console of my car, and it's like a one in a million shot, but if I drop my phone, it's going to go right down that hole. Is, any, is that happening to anybody else? But I just, it's like a black hole that just sucks stuff down there, and so those are kind of days, and, and I actually have a... Uh, I have a college roommate that as I was preparing for this message this week, I had a college roommate post something online, and his, his name's Chris um, Sovic, and he was my college roommate, real good guy, played football in school, and he was a heck of an athlete, um, but he's actually a police officer, he was in my wedding, uh, but he was a, he's a police officer in Michigan, and uh, this week, he, was, he posted a, a video that I wanted to share with you this week, and I think they're, they're generally optimists and pessimists, but I think it's really... God shows us things in our lives, and he has a way, and I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but he has a way of really pulling things into perspective and, and really uh, showing us things. And, and so my, uh, I was talking to Chris actually yesterday. He posted a video that I want to share with you here in a second. I want to give you a little bit of background. He's a police officer in Michigan, and uh, the, we, the day he posted this video, that week before that, he had been called um, to check on one of his fellow officers that was missing uh, didn't show up for work, and they called Chris to go to his house and check it out, and went to his house and found that he had actually committed suicide and had a family, and he had to be the one that, and, and then literally two days after that, he uh, had another friend of his, another officer that had a 14-year-old son and his friend that was killed tragically in a car accident, and so he'd had just this tremendously horrific week uh, and was just overwhelmed uh, with, with all of that, and, and so as he was driving, he just explained to me yesterday that as he was driving home from the, the last funeral, uh, he was going down the road, and uh, uh, like a piece of tire came off a semi and smacked the mirror on the side of his car, and he just had this, he said it was completely calm, he didn't have the radio on or anything, and he was just thinking about, he was so heavy with all this, and so I want to share, he posted this video, and I wanna, just wanted to give you a little bit of background of that, so here's, here's the video, take a look at this video. Oh, by the way. Oh my gosh, what a beer! <laughs> it's, oh my gosh! This is great. What a great day! <laughs> you ever have a day like that? Uh. But he's just got this laughter. He, he always had this laugh that when he gets rolling, um, he can't stop. And I'll never forget sitting with him in the back of college church at Olivet Nazarene University. And a guy was singing, and he hit the biggest, loudest, sour note. And Chris got tickled, and, just, and that laugh right there. Uh, but it was just, you know, I think that sometimes we just have, we have so much going on in our lives. And, and I think some, he just shared with me how God really just... Uh, just came into that car, and when that happened to him, it was just like overwhelming sense of peace, and that God has this, and he has our back, and so I just wanted to share that with you. So as, I'm, as I go through this this morning, and so um, here's the thing. I'm not going to come at you this morning, and I'm going I'm to go quick. I'm going to kind of a shotgun approach here with my, with my sermon this morning, but there are, um, <clears throat> I want you to pay attention to this. I am optimistic, and you, and you think about being an optimist or a pessimist. I am optimistic, not, because, not based on what I feel. Because honestly, some days I don't feel optimistic. Some days I go through difficult times, and there are actually seasons of our life that we go through that you may not necessarily be optimistic. But I'm not optimistic based on what I feel. I'm optimistic based on what God says. And I want to share that with you this morning. I'm optimistic on, on what God promises in his word and, and in scriptures. And so that's what gives me hope. That's what, that's what gives me peace. That what, that's what makes me optimistic. And so I want to share with you. So I'm going to share with you eight things. I have an eight-point sermon this morning. So if anyone's legal now, no, no. Some of you are like, oh, man, I picked the wrong Sunday. 
I have eight points, and we're going to be out here about three. Um, no, I'm not. I'm going to go. It's a shotgun approach. It's going to be fast. But uh, eight points out of the book of Romans from the eighth chapter. So eight points out of the eighth chapter of Romans on why we should be optimistic. And so I'm going to hit them hard. We're going to jump into them. So here we go. The first one, my sins are forgiven and my eternity is secure. I am optimistic because my sins are forgiven and my eternity is secure. Let me read you Romans chapter 8, 1 through 2. It says this, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Don't you find that awesome? I do. I find hope in that. No condemnation. I know that's a big word, but there's no condemnation. That means there is no judgment. So, uh, so who is this for? It's for those who are in Christ Jesus. So for you this morning that have said, hey, I believe in Jesus. I have accepted him as my personal savior. There is no condemnation for you this morning. That gives me hope. I've been forgiven. Is anybody, I, I have, personally, I have been forgiven a lot. Anybody had to ask that question a lot? I, I, you know, over and over, say, I've been forgiven. I need to be forgiven a lot for a lot of different things. When I think about the blood of Jesus that shed for me and he has risen from the dead so that I could be free from guilt and have a sense of peace, that makes me optimistic. I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I'm, not, I, I, my, I'm not even hopeful. I know for a fact that my sins are forgiven and I have been forgiven and if I check out right now, I'm good. That gives me hope. It me, makes me optimistic. So I'm optimistic because my sins are forgiven and my eternity is secure. Regardless of what I've done, regardless of where I've been, regardless of what I've said, regardless of anything that I've ever done, if I asked, I, I received his forgiveness, and that makes me optimistic. Point number one, write that down. We're optimistic because our sins are forgiven and our eternity is secure. Secondly, Jesus is at the right hand of God praying for me. I am optimistic because Jesus is praying for me. Isn't that weird? Isn't that, don't you find that fascinating that Jesus prays for us? Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, I love that part. It's, it's more than just that he died for us. And I think sometimes as Christians we stop right there. But more than that, he was raised to life, so he's still alive is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Interceding, another big word. What's that mean? It means, and I looked it up, here's the definition, to intercede it is to speak to someone in order to defend or help another person. Have you ever had anybody do that for you? Have you ever really stepped in like you were going to be in some serious trouble? And I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you, but I, you know, when I was a when I was a kid, we, um, I was a little kid, and parents took us on vacation. We were with, my grandparents were with us. Went to this restaurant, and we ordered this. The, I, was, I just remember, it was corn soup. Sounds gross, but it was really good. And so we ordered this corn soup, and, and we were eating this corn soup, and, and man, it was so good. And we were eating it, and I think I had like two bowls of it. And then my dad is like, hey, I think I, think I want another bowl. And, you know, it was like all you could eat deal. And we're like, yeah, sign me up for the corn soup. And, and so he, uh, so Farron and I were like, yeah, I think that um, we'll take another bowl too. And my dad's like, are you boys sure? So we, I don't know. I, I don't know why it was a big deal, but maybe corn soup was really expensive. I don't know. But he's like, if you don't eat that, you're going to be in trouble. Because we didn't waste food at our house. Anybody else have that happen? We just, you clean your plate, buddy. And so uh, if you order that, you got to eat the whole thing. And so we were like, oh, Dad, we're good. You know, we got it. You know, bring on the corn soup. We bring the corn soup, and it's been like a long-running joke in our family. Like anybody has too much plate on food on their plate, we've got a little corn soup there. But uh, it's just a running joke because he's like, he told us, like, if we didn't finish that bowl of soup, we were going we to get spanking. That's hardcore. <laughs> telling you. I think you kids have it tough. So I sat there, and I started eating the corn soup, and it was like a miracle. God has, the, the more I ate, the more it was there to eat. <laughs> it was like that miracle where the, you know, the lady in the oil, and it just kept filling the, you know, it was like that. It was like that miracle. It was corn soup. It was just the more I ate, the more it was there. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I'm stuffed. And I, we couldn't do it. 
I could not do it. So we knew, uh, Farron and I looked at each other and we we're like, we got to get, here's our only plan. We've got to get back to the room and put on every pair of underwear that we have. <laughs> that was our plan. <laughs> that was our go-to move. Just, just put them on, layer them. But my grandpa, who was with us, I found out later, because we got back, no, no whipping. We're like, hey, we, we made it. You know, we didn't know what happened, but I found out later in life that my grandpa was so concerned for us that he pulled, it, pulled my dad aside and said, you better not whip them boys. <laughs> he interceded for us. I just love that picture. The thought I want you to get a picture of this. The thought of Jesus, God's only son, sitting at the right hand of the Father. He has God's ear, and he's praying for each one of us. Does that not blow your mind? You know, I think as a church, we tend to, we tend to throw that out. You know, oh, I'll be praying for you. You know, it's like Halloween candy. Have a little prayer. A little prayer over here. You know, we, we tend to dish that out. And I just wonder if we really mean that. You ever, you ever had somebody tell you that they're praying? You've been going through a tough time and people put their arm around you and say, hey, I'm praying for you. You know that there are some people in my life that do that to me and, and not trying to judge anybody, but there are some people in life that I just, I wonder if they're really doing, but there are some people that put their arm around me and say, hey, I'm praying for you. You know what I know? That I know that when they get back home, and they're reading their Bible, and they're getting on their knees at God, that they're actually going to be praying for me. You never have people like that in your life? Yeah, that you know it? It means something, doesn't it? I just wonder what that looks like. What's that look like when Jesus prays to the Father? Let me read that scripture again. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. You ever wonder what that looks like? What is Jesus saying about me? You know, God, he's a good guy. He really is. He makes really stupid decisions, but don't give up on him. He's made some really bad choices, but don't give up on him, God. He's a good guy. I know his heart. Tarry a little bit longer, Jesus. I, I, I just, I don't know what he looks like. I don't know what that looks like. But I don't care, whatever it is. But the thought, I'm not sure what Jesus is saying, but if there is anyone I want pleading my case, it's Jesus Christ. And that gives me hope. It's not what you know, it's who you know. <laughs> and that phrase has never been more true than in situation. I don't know a lot about the Bible. I don't know about stuff. It's not what we know. It's who we know. And that makes all the difference. Not because we know a bunch of stuff about the gospel. It's just because we know the Son. And Jesus is going to the Father and praying for us. So, number three. So, number two is that Jesus is at the right hand of God praying for me. Number three, that gives me hope and gives me, helps me to be optimistic is my future victory is greater than my present pain. Think about that. I'm an optimistic, I'm optimistic and I have hope because my future victory is greater than my present pain. Romans chapter eight, verse 18 says this. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Basically, what Paul is saying is, I'm optimistic because what I'm going through right now is doing something in me that God is going to sharpen me, conform me into the image of Jesus, and my future victory is greater than my present pain. That's, that gives me hope. And I know some of you are probably going through junk right now, and you're like, man, you don't even have any idea, Trent. How can that be possible? This pain that I feel right now is so heavy and so real. I'm agonizing in it. And you hear what Paul says here. He says it's what we're going through right now doesn't even compare to the glory that we're going to get later. I love that. James even says it. 
James puts it this way in James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come our way, consider it an opportunity of great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Testing of faith produces perseverance, mature, not lacking anything. The stuff that we're going through right now is shaping us, is molding us for God's glory later. And I think some of you read that and you think that, you know, that it's not worth comparing Paul. And you're like, well, that's easy for Paul to say. Let me tell you what Paul endured. Just some of the things that Paul endured. Paul was beaten, he was shipwrecked, he was whipped, he was left for dead, they thought he was dead since he looked so dead, he was bitten by a snake, and over and over and over again he was tortured for his relationship with Jesus. And he says it's not even worth comparing to what the glory of God will do. That's awesome. That gives me hope. Once you see the reward, you're going to say, oh, you know what? That wasn't so bad. You ever done that? I was trying to think of a way to illustrate that. And the only thing, the only thing that I could think of was when uh, we had our kids, you know. And Cheryl, you know, we had Morgan and she was, took like four days to get here or something ridiculous. But I remember Cheryl went in and we were like, you know, have Morgan, our first kid, we didn't know what to expect. And she was like, I'm just going to do this, you know, I'm, I'm no, no medicine, I don't want to hurt the baby. And then about 12 hours into labor, she was like, okay, epidural, please, check, check, please. But we went through and just to watch her go through the, agon, the agony of childbirth and to go through all that and the pain. But then, when you hold your firstborn, I look in their face. And I held her, and I'm like, you know, that wasn't so bad. (laughs) Do that again? (laughs) But it wasn't for her. The the reward is there. You know, I joke about that, but we had two more kids, so. But you you look at that, and I I just think that's what it's going to be like when we see the glory of God revealed in our lives. And I think sometimes we're so focused on on what's happening to us right now that we fail to see the glory and how God is shaping us and how he's molding us and how he's using that to his glory. Fourth thing, my mind is filled with the peace of God. Romans 8, 6 says this, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. What this is saying to me is I don't have to be dominated by sinful desires and impure thoughts. And through God's word, I can renew my mind and stop thinking the negative, earthly, sinful thoughts and instead get an eternal perspective on God's, based on God's truth. Have you ever seen people go through junk in their life and they're just as calm as can be? And you're like, what in the world? How do you do that? They're just, they're, they're strength in the midst of, of just sheer turmoil in their life you ever seen anybody do that i was trying to think you know and gerald donahoe was a guy that was around here and he he just struck me as that type of guy he's just calm i never saw him get wound up about too much and i believe it's because he had the peace and the ability to renew his mind and focus on a bigger picture and i think um I think even right now, it's easy for us to get caught up in a lot of negativity with this election, and we see it all over social media and all over the news. And um, anybody, any news watchers in here? I absolutely hate the news. I just don't watch it. I can't do it. I, it just, oof. you know, Cheryl's like, "Can we watch the news?" I'm like, "No." And I think it's from childhood because when we had three channels and that's all it was on, you know, you're like, "No." Just don't watch the news. It's toxic. For me, it is anyway. And I think through God's word and his promises, I'm able to have a kingdom view, a world view. And for, more, for me, I find peace knowing the end of the story. It's not about one candidate or the other for me. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's a spoiler alert if you don't know. Um, Jesus is king and he wins. Done deal. <laughs> so put that in your pipe and smoke it. That was, I don't know where that came from. That, 
That was, just, that was a saying my dad used to have, and it always got him in trouble, and I'm pretty sure it got me in trouble right there. <laughs> I'm optimistic based, I'm optimistic because the peace of mind that I feel when I read God's word, and when I focus on that, and I read through his word, and I read the promises that he has for me, I don't worry about junk. I don't. He gives us peace of mind. So I'm optimistic because my mind is filled with peace of God. Number five, if, and this, I love this one. We just sang about it a few minutes ago. If God is for me, who can be against me? Romans chapter 8, 32 through 33. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. And I know some of you are thinking, well, you know what, Trent? I know somebody that's against me right now, that doesn't like me, that criticizes me, that shoots me down. And the truth is, there are always going to be people in our lives that criticize us, that may not like us, that may take shots at you, but if God is for you, who can be against you? If that doesn't give you strength this morning, I'm not sure I know what does. We know the boss. I tell a lot of stories about my kids, but I remember when I was managing the bank, and the kid, kids were small, Morgan and Rachel would come in to see me at the bank, and I managed the whole bank, and everybody knew who they were, and they thought they were really cool because they could come behind the teller line and just, and just get all you could eat dumb, dumb suckers. <laughs> And they would run around and they would watch the video cameras in the bank and watch people and, and, and do that. And they were, but people knew, like, well, those are Trent's kids. Here's the thing. If the boss is for me, who can be against me? I'm optimistic because I believe that my God is for me that he plans to bless me, that he plans to prosper me and not to harm me, to give me hope and a future. My God has plans to do the same for you. Number six, I'm optimistic because God's spirit helps me in my weakness. I'm optimistic because when I'm weak, he is strong. Romans 8, 24 through 26 says, who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us with our weakness. When I'm down, He holds me up. When I'm hurting, He comforts me. When I'm alone, He's my friend. When I'm weak, He's strong. Even on a bad day, I'm optimistic because I get to know Him a little better. You ever notice that when you have a bad day, how it drives you to God? When there's tragedy in our life, we want to we hit our knees and find God immediately? You ever notice that? Are you relying on God's strength to help you in your weakness? In that moment of temptation or that moment of trial, are you crying out for help? Are you getting to experience the power of the Holy Spirit working through you and holding you up when everything else is telling you to quit? I'm optimistic because God's, help, God's Spirit helps me when I'm weak. Number seven, I'm optimistic when God's working everything in my life for good. I want you to focus on this scripture, Romans 8, 28. And we know, and I underlined some things for you in here, and we know that in what? In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, God works. You know, and I, I did some study on the Greek word there and the word all in this passage. And if you look that word up all, if you work the, the word all up, and you look at the original Greek that the Bible was written in, do you know what that translates to? All. <laughs> it translates to all. All things. Everything. Not just some things. The good and the bad. And see, the thing is, there's this upper story and a lower story. And the lower story is really throughout Scripture, you can look at it, you can see it played out. The lives of Moses and Abraham and Isaac and David, there's this lower story. It's all this junk that happens to us day in, day, day out. It's our everyday lives. And we get so focused on the lower story that we, don't, we fail to see that God has a bigger picture. There's a bigger overarching plan for our lives and for what God is doing in this earth other than what's happening right in front of you. 
Listen to me, there is not a thing, you might want to write this down, there is not a thing that will happen in your life that the goodness of our God will not transform into something eventually that brings about glory. There is not a thing that will happen in your life that the goodness of our God will not transform into, some, into something eventually that brings about glory. What, what Satan meant for evil, God will take and use for good. God appears out of nowhere to save the day, and sometimes you don't feel him, sometimes you don't see him, sometimes you don't think he's working, but your faith tells you that he's there. I'm optimistic because God working in everything in my life, and I'm trusting that. I can't see it, but I'm trusting that his word is true and that he tells me that he's working for good in my life. The last one. Number eight is my favorite one. <laughs> Love this one. I'm optimistic because nothing can separate me from the love of God. Think about that one for a second. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says this. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor demons, neither the present nor the future or any power, neither height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love that. That gives me hope that no matter where I go, my God is there. No matter what I do, He still loves me. No matter what happens to me, he is always for me. Nothing can separate us. I'm going to ask the band to come. I want you to get a grip on that. And I hope, I hope there's somebody here today that, that really will get that and get to feel that today. That there is nothing in this world that can separate you from the love of God. There is not a hole deep enough. There is not a place far enough that you can run. There is not a cave dark enough. There is not a car, a plane, a train fast enough to outrun God's love. You can try to resist. You can't hide from him. He will find you. He will chase after you. He's consistently chasing after us, saying, I love you. I want a relationship with you. If that doesn't create optimism in your life, I don't know what does. That there's nothing that I've done. The fact is there are a really lot of bad things in this world. I get it. But the reality is that I still have a God that is bigger than the absolute worst thing in this world. So when you think about this this week, and everything's falling apart, and my life stinks, and this is the worst thing ever, and I can't believe that we're at this place, step back and realize that your God is bigger. I'm going to ask you to stand this morning. My dad always had a saying, and I hated it growing up, because he would always say it all the time, and I'd be stressed out over something, and my dad would just say, Trent, God's bigger than what's the matter. Yeah, yeah, I know. And he would say it over and over to me. God's bigger than what's the matter, Trent. And he would tell me that over and over. And it's finally sinking in. God is bigger than what's the matter in your life. I don't know where you guys are. I don't know what kind of garbage you brought in here this morning, but we have reason to be hopeful as believers of Jesus Christ in this world. There's a lot of bad things, but there's so much good. Are you a hummingbird or are you a buzzard? Are you looking for it? Because I promise you, if you look for it, you'll find it. I'll leave you with this. I'm optimistic, not, not because of what I see or what I feel. It's, not, it's more than a feeling. It's not just about what I feel. 
I'm optimistic not because of what I see, but I'm, opt I'm optimistic based on what God says. And this is what he's told us. That my sins are forgiven. That Jesus is on the right hand praying for me. That my present sufferings are not worth even comparing. That my mind is filled with peace. My God is for me. God's spirit helps me when I'm weak. God is working everything for my good. And nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for what your word teaches us. Thank you that we can be positive people. Lord, that we can look for the goodness in this world. That we can, that we can find that you are still at work in people's lives. That you are still have the ability to do miracles. That you still have the ability to save us. That you still have the ability to love us despite all of our junk. That you still are in control, God. And that gives me peace, gives me hope, makes me optimistic. Lord, that you have control of all this. God, I just ask that you would just fall on this place. Lord, that you would search your heart hearts this morning in ways that we've been negative, in ways that we just can't believe everything is going on in our lives. Help us, Lord, to turn our hearts towards you and to your word so we can have a renewing of our mind. And that you can instill in us this spirit of optimism. Lord, I ask that uh, if there's anybody here, maybe you're here this morning and you're like, man, Trent, I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't experienced that. I haven't asked Christ in my life. I'm not even sure. I believe all this. I I'm kind of curious, but I want to know. Maybe you're somebody here this morning that says, you know what? I I've allowed myself to slip into this negative state. And I've allowed myself to fall away from reading God's word and and finding the good in God, that you would just pray this prayer with me. God, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for doubting you. Forgive me for, for thinking that you're not in control or forgetting that, Lord. Help me to place my trust in you completely. God, come into my life. I ask you to take control of my life. And Lord, just I pray if somebody's here and they prayed that prayer, Lord, that you know who they are. I'm not going to ask them to raise their hand, but let me pray for them. God, if there's somebody here that prayed that, I just ask that you would just fall on them tonight, today. Lord, that you would just fill their hearts full, that they would experience the richness and the fullness that comes with a relationship with you. Not that everything's roses, Lord, and that we still walk through difficult times in our life, but we have so much hope for the glory that lies ahead. God, take us out of this place this morning. Help us to be a positive people. Help us to reflect your love and goodness to those around us in our community and bring us back safe next week. God, go with us today in your precious holy name.